episode 95. You're flying. Mountain, mountain, <laughs> mountain. Um, episode 94 with Philly McMahon. Philly McMahon needs no introduction. Philly, how's things, man? Great, everything's good, can't complain. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, since I've spoken to you the last time, the last time you were playing for Dublin in the midst of it and all that type of stuff, what's it like being on the outside now looking in? Yeah, a lot has changed. So, um, in my personal life, I have a, a nine-month-year-old boy now, Lennon. Um, so, uh, we, like the kind of I knew when I retired that I'd, I suppose, done enough or done things while I was playing to to have opportunities when I finished, and um, and I'm very lucky to have those. And, and I suppose. I did my toe on a couple of things when I, since I've retired, and I've done a little bit of punditry. Um, I've been doing performance coaching with Bohemians, and I've been doing a little bit of media work, and and, uh, and ultimately I've kind of tried to start to discover what is what's works and what doesn't work from being a new father, being a new father and, and a husband at the same time, yes. you know. Um, because when when you have a baby, you're in this love bubble, and you know over time you feel like you're doing a lot more because you're doing extra but yeah. you have to keep doing more and more and more and more and open to that and be curious to it so uh, business is going really well and uh, I'm excited for a couple of things in, in, in the business uh, area I'm in and uh, yeah yeah it's going great and when when you step away like I'm sure you had loads of extra time because like you were training some mornings some mm. evenings did you like I've, I've I've listened to stories from other ex-athletes so you know, were high performance, high level that kind of, when they move away from it they're just like, oh fuck What do we do next? What? Like, oh yeah. fuck Yeah, well you again, know. I was um, I'd one eye on retirement Right You know, when I was in the cauldron of GAA and championship I was 100% focused on that but at a certain point I would have seen what players past teammates would have went through and I got to the point where I started kind of just going right what's next for me you yeah. know this is never going to last forever so what do I need to get after and um, towards towards even particularly the last two seasons I suppose I started to you know focus on that those next steps and as soon as I finished it, like my wife won't thank me for it but like I, I wasn't I didn't have the time that most athletes would have like you know so I was working bohemians full time um, that was like three, four nights a week, you know. And I'd been working at, I'm working at Mount Joy Prison, and I went back playing for the club and I'm playing a little bit of soccer as well. So, um, but right now I'm carrying a bit of an injury, and I'm actually really kind of experiencing what I probably should have been like when I for, first finished, where yes. I'm, I'm not playing sport in the evenings after I walk and going home to, the, to, to my wife and my son, you know. So, it's a little bit different and it's something that you, it takes time to adjust to. That's what I would say that a lot of athletes experience is like going home and I'm sure it gets to a point where the family are going, get out of the house, like, you know, <laughs> leave us alone, you're doing our heads in. But yeah. uh, I think just getting the happy medium is important to me. I just haven't got it yet, but I'm hoping to get it the next couple of months probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah just, just let us know. If you ever get it, let us know. Yeah, Finish yeah, him, man. Yeah. <laughs> still, uh, still fighting to get that yeah. balance. Well, if, 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 if my wife says, you know, I think you need to go training, that's a good, that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Just go, just yeah, go, yeah. just go, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. And you touched on fatherhood there. So how how are you finding that? Like I I found that that gave me a bit of purpose in life. I really yeah. really um I love being a father. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I'm not great at it. I, yeah. When I say I'm not great at it, it's a constant struggle. But I do love it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's very hard to compare fathers for fathers and say who's good and who's yes, not because yeah, everybody yeah. is different you yeah. know like I would you know, and I was sitting beside you but I would think you are a great father <laughs> because I know the relationship you have with your two kids and, and I know Yvonne's a great mother as well like so mm. and I for some reason gravitate towards people like you like yes. you know of other friends that are great fathers and I'm not saying I don't hang around fellas that are shit fathers yeah, no, no, no. I just for okay. some reason have a lot yeah. of mates that are yeah. really good at those things and yeah. and I love learning from people like you and, and other friends that I have like you know the kind of relationship in particular obviously Max 
I know Christian as well, but like the, the ratio we have with Max is, is brilliant for me and it's something that I'd be looking at and saying I'd love to have that with Lennon, you know? Yes. Um but yeah, no, I, I suppose it does completely throw a curveball at you and it's kind of like it's tough, it's challenging, but it doesn't matter. Like that, that all goes away when you see your kid's face, you know, yeah, you yeah. see him smile or you you're yeah. comforting when he's crying, like it's it's one of the most ex uh, you know, special experiences I've had in my life, you know, so, um, I always say it's like having a new car, you know, it's not as, like, you know, as big as having a, you know, yeah, but yeah. when you get a new car and you want to, you know, you go to work and you want to get out and drive the new car all the time, you want to go home and, and see what has happened, you know, yeah, what's yeah, he doing, yeah. what's he, yeah. so, um, the difficulty is I have my own business, so I can't really take paternity leave either, like, you know, yeah. um, so that, that was quite difficult, Sarah would probably think I was Dawson <laughs> up here and not doing much, but it's hard and, and it's tiring that you're you're working hard and then you're going home and it doesn't stop you just keep going mm -hmm. you know and you're I suppose there's a couple of key things like for me that I'm still experimenting with like one of them and anybody that's a new father listening in will, will have this experience is like you go home from work you try to take over the reins a little bit because Sarah's had them all day yeah and then he goes to bed he goes to, again uh, off air we were saying like he goes to bed at half eight which is great and then you're juggling, but I'm wrecked here. If I go to bed now, I'll be fresh in the morning. Yeah. But then you've no time for yourself. Yeah. You've yeah. no time. You're just working and being a father, and you don't like so. So sunny, some evenings I'll just chill out. Yeah, yeah. And I'll get to bed at twelve, and I wake up the next morning going, "Oh shit, I fucking done that, Jesus." <laughs> but yeah, so so um, I'm trying to get on top of other things that might help me with those things, like training, like nutrition, like recovery. To see does that impact me energy to to help me be more efficient in those areas? Yeah, it's um, something we don't probably think of as fathers. Can we get healthier to be to enjoy it a bit better? Yeah, yeah. No, no. I I definitely think like I would try and eat as healthy as I can and rest and look after myself because if I don't do that, I'm going home like a bleeding antichrist, yeah. and nobody wants one of them at the gaff. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So. I try and look after how I'm eating, how I'm resting. Don't get it right all the time. Sorry, Yvonne. <laughs> but, but do you know what I mean? You become a better person or easier to live with and easier to be around mm. if you're looking after them areas. Definitely. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But um, also, the best advice I ever got. I've made loads of mistakes as a father, but the best advice I ever got, and I did do it, do you know what I mean? is read to your kids at night time. Oh, yeah. No matter yeah. what it is, just yeah, read to them yeah. at night time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like that, yeah. And Sarah's even, doing a little bit of it. I'm, I'm honestly not doing it, but, like, but I should, yeah. But now I found with the young fellas, like from young, grown up, like, especially boys, like girls that talk all day, but mm. I, my experience with boys, they don't really let you know how they're feeling. So... And a, yeah. a therapist told me this before. If I am having a conversation with boys, right, I get all the information when I'm driving because they don't, they're like two dogs. They don't like making eye contact. <laughs> Every see dogs, they go. <laughs> so it's like you get all the information. So when you're reading to them or at night time, mm. that's when I hear all about their days. Ah, yeah, well, I tell like you, they're looking up at the ceiling. Well, I'll tell you what your man doing today, right? <laughs> but they're not making eye contact right, with right. you. So that's when you get all the info. I'll like take that on board, definitely. Yeah, so board. that's the best advice I ever got. And it's, you hear it all then, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like but it. now I, I, do, uh, I do enjoy it. And the punditry, my ma yeah. tells me, you see, my ma is, she, my ma is one of them, up the dub, sorry, she's about 80. I love your ma, she's great. Yeah, she, she's but great. she tells me all, reads all the columns and how <laughs> How did you get into that, or was that always something that you said, yeah, I'm going to do that? Uh, not really, no, because um, it's kind of, I don't even know the words, it's it's kind of a paranoia thing that maybe, I don't think all GA players, but certainly Dublin players, would have had around the media. Yes. Because the media, you have, to, you have to think about it, when you're playing, the media are trying to get in at you. Yeah, and yeah, get they information are. information mm -hmm. to, first of all, promote the game, to the wider audience but also to get that little juicy bit that possibly could give them more viewers or, or readers and so so it wasn't uh, there was for me it was kind of like will I won't I you know and um, 
I sat down with um, with the Irish Independent and they explained what they wanted me to do and I actually was really intrigued and the the pitch for me sold it like what they, what they wanted me to do like you know they wanted to make like I for said like the the only things I won't go near is things that I specifically don't own information wise yes so if it's about something in the change room environment or something that was said for the group I don't own that the group owned that yeah yeah and and I think that's important that that authenticity is important that you kind of like if you go tell stories about others and their group well then people will turn off and go he's just out for himself like, yeah you know? yeah yeah but what I wanted to do I think there's a there's certainly a lot of really good pundits out there there's probably a lot of pundits out there that have aged a little bit and the game has moved on and I said to myself you know what I've got something there that I, I'm really I'm really good and passionate about you know the the performance side of, of GAA and, and sport in general but and what happened was I, I said look I'll try a couple, of, a couple of them and see how it goes and then we'll, we'll sort something out then if you want to go long term and uh, I tried a couple and I went do you know what this is like therapy because mm -hmm. uh, again a lot of my friends that were tired before me teammates they were kind of like they were telling me that they were struggling a little bit and I wasn't struggling and I was like why am I not struggling and then I was having a conversation about the punching act I'm actually not suppressing any information that I have here yeah yeah that I want to tell like they're great times yes why would you hold in that there's there's bad times and great times but that information like imagine having like a, a, like for example when someone gets pregnant yeah it must be extremely hard for women to not be able to tell someone for a certain period of time. Yes. It must be extremely hard. The excitement right? and yeah, yeah. And uh I'm not saying that's what football's like, yes. but if you've I've played fourteen years with the dubs like and if I can't talk about my experience and the knowledge I have and gained what like why what's that's that all about? Like why would you not be able to do that? Yeah. And what how, what benefit would you get from actually speaking about your experiences, not the teams? Yeah. And um that was brilliant for me like I, rem I just remember thinking like that's so good for me to not suppress the feelings that I should have or emotions I should have around a sport that I really love yeah yeah no no uh, me ma really yeah uh me man listen she'd be the first viewer on oh, this oh she texts me she texts <laughs> me all the time about the um the the columns I've written and I love it like yeah, I, love yeah. it. I have about four or five people that text me yeah all the time and Generally, it's all positive. Yeah. Someone will give me some inform, like you know, I call it positive criticism. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, I love that. I love yeah. that. It means it's it's making a difference to somebody, like you know. And you were on. My ma fills me in on all this. I don't <laughs> look at TV. Your mum's your research. Oh, she's, I don't look. I don't look at the TV at all. But she was like, you were on some bleeding restaurant, the it? restaurant. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, you made a cuddle, and I made. Then she made a cuddle for me because you yeah. made your cuddle. And, yeah. Like that's that's how how do you like when you go into something like the restaurant? Do you say do you? go in and just say ah, I'll have a bit of crack here or do you go in still with about 50% of the athlete in your brain and 50% of yeah, it's I want question. to win this it's a good question <laughs> yeah because uh, I've always loved that show because I'm a foodie like you know yeah, I, yeah. I have my own food company and I love I love uh, myself and Sarah would go for food generally yeah. prior to Lennon uh, every weekend and try different places you know yeah. it's probably once a month now but I got asked to do it in 2017 and 2018, I think, and, and my dad was ill at that time, okay. and I uh, couldn't do it. So, so when they came back to me and asked me to do it again, the rest, the, sorry, the the menu was all done okay. from 2017 and 18. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it definitely. Like I, I love, uh, I love the show. I'm not constrained by, you know, being a current Dublin player and. Uh, let's give it a lash but like went in kind of with the perception of like just enjoy this see what chefs do um, and if I get three plus stars I'll be laughing you know yeah. if I get two I'll just be rip, ripped apart by Mossy <laughs> so that's the worst thing but um, I went in and I wanted the, the, the menu to represent who I am Northside Dub with a Belfast uh, connection through my dad and uh, a little bit of my mum's home cooking food, my wife, the, we, we, um, we had a shoe bun type pastry that we had at the wedding, wanted that to be in it as well, like, right. you know, so 
really, really being true to who I am and, you know, yeah, being proud, particularly being proud of, you know, the Coddenham and North Dublin. Yeah, yeah. So it went really well. The the first part, for the starters, it was on the money. The coddle was, oh, it was, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. Like, there was 10 parts to that coddle. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. just there, put all that in the pot. It was like, yeah. step by step. And Gary, who was the chef, was like, unbelievable. To, and he's from Donegal, like, so right. he never really had the coddle. So he yeah. done a good job. But um, the mains were amazing and the desserts were amazing. It was just... We got four stars out of five, which is absolutely buzzing with. It was just, I think, uh, we gave them a lot of food, and then at the end, there was, the desserts were a lot sweet. Like, there was no kind of other taste. It was more sweet throughout the, the, the buns, you know? So, yeah, look, the only problem with a show like that is that you can't do it again. Yes. That's how good it was. That's how much I loved it. Like, um, But you get asked to do these shows, like Strictly Come Dancing or Hell Week and stuff like that, and some of them that, you know... You, you kind of attempted some of that you were kind of like no it's just not me and then yeah. that just landed for me I was like yeah that's me all over you know I could see in Hell Week yeah I could see in Hell Week yeah I've been asked there a few times um, yeah. the guy that does Hell Week the, the, the main guy that runs Hell Week is now a part of um, a TV series that I'm on at the minute right that we're, we're filming at the minute in Mount Joy Prison called Me Machines yes so it's not out it's out the public but your podcast is getting the exclusive now John you know so um, but myself and Rory O'Connor also known as Rory Stories I go into Mount Joy we're training uh, 10 10 to 12 prisoners to play the prison guards right. in a venue in a GA venue we, we're not sure whereabouts you know but it's going to be uh, it's, it's going to try show the public that these guys obviously have made a mistake in the past, yeah. but what really matters now going forward is the future. Yeah. And and also that when young young people are watching this that they they say, Do you know what? I don't end up there. Yeah. 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 Now um that's it's nice it's nice to see that because I know plenty of people and and what Carl Jung says everybody we meet is us mm. from a previous time or whatever yeah, yeah. it's like people we meet like that in life but for the grace of God do you know what I mean people make mm. mistakes they get mixed up in wrong circles or whatever you know what I mean and that it's not us is a bit of luck or something else you know what I mean so yeah. be careful when you're pointing them fingers you know what I mean be very careful yeah well you've got a problem now in society and it's caused by a lot of things but we've got this thing called social exclusion mm. which is very it's a very problematic issue for society because you've got what it means is you've got a majority and a minority mm. and in a lot of things the majority create the issues the minority have mm. so for example a couple of weeks back there was a politician that was outraged with what was happening in O'Connor Street, rightly so, but spoke about uh, people that struggle with addiction and called them as kind of labelled them as druggies. Yes. Now, that that explains exactly what social exclusion is, right? Mm. So there's somebody that's voted in, mm. that's given a job, yeah. a well-paid job, to make a change, make a difference, and he is labelling and stigmatising, pointing the finger at the most vulnerable people in society. Mm. In this big drug trade, the most vulnerable people are drug people that are struggling with drug addiction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's pointing the finger. Now, imagine the constituency he represents. How many people in that constituency know somebody or are struggling with addiction? Yeah. How would you be able to go ever to go to him and say, "I need you to push me in the right direction to get supports to help my young son, daughter, or me?" to get into recovery yeah. how would you have to go to him yeah there's a representative like so and in, and the overall kind of structure of it is basically people politically create laws create policies mm. so you're creating the problem yeah if your policy doesn't solve or manage this as best as can because it'll never get rid of it we, there's no, no point in saying that yeah, but yeah. if it managed it yeah. well then you, you, you can say well you're doing something there but it doesn't and I think there's no political capital in it's easy pointing at yeah. like there's 
plenty of levels above so we see a bloke on the street or in a tent and he's suffering from crack addiction heroin addiction right it's very easy he looks the same as the other blokes in that mm. but levels above him there's people in that house over there or there's people in middle class areas or that are suffering with the same thing but true look or their parents or whatever that financially they have a safety net yeah. or multiple safety nets to fall through before things go to that level yeah. not everyone has that yeah. you know what I mean For, yeah. so if I'm pointing the finger at this fella and going whatever it's 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 like I need to be very careful you know what do, I mean? do and, and the, 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 the thing is like I'm very passionate about that area mm. and there's a lot of people on social media that when they hear those remarks of a politician they were very unhappy but it's not that we should slaughter this guy no 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 we should educate and yeah. and if he then makes the decision that it's still that's his opinion that's great mm. that's you're entitled to that but yeah. but for me um, if you right now said everybody in that housing estate there are, are druggies yeah I'd love to say, do you want to come over and meet yeah. a few of them? Yeah, yeah. And you'd notice, you'd, you'd have a conversation, if it was easily, you know, accessible to people to, to have these conversations, just not. Yeah. But if you were to go over to these people and say, can I ask you, you know, what made you go on drugs? Yeah. I guarantee you a lot of them would say sexual abuse, mm -hmm. uh, mental health, yeah. uh, poverty, um, generational poverty, yeah. you know, mother and father, siblings whatever it is you know it's being passed down that's societal structures mm. that mm. that that then would come back to you as a politician wouldn't it yeah because you'd be going well i meant to be impacting those things here yeah so now i can't point the finger at you because mm -hmm. that's actually be pointing the finger back at me yeah so um we, we we should not fall into the trap of going you said this so you're you're cancelled your distance yeah, yeah. you know so that's the society we live in if we don't bridge that social inequality gap um, we'll have a lot of ill-informed uneducated people talking out on social media which causes like so much loggerheads on, yeah. in, on Twitter particularly yeah. and that is very dangerous and like that person that said druggies if you had that conversation with me when I was 17 or 18 I probably would have said the same thing yeah, that he said. So would I have. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I would have. Now, with life experience on my side, with addiction in my family and friend groups and stuff like that, now I'm aware and I've seen that these people were just good people, mm. but just in pain or whatever, and yeah. they chose this path. And a lot of them got help and some died because of their illness. Do you know, John, another great example is, um, again, walking in Mount Joy, I was having a conversation with a young person and he says, I'm thankful I came to prison because it's, it's made me think and change. And, and I said to him, I said to myself, geez, that's good, isn't it? And then I said to myself, no, hold on a second. If you're saying going to prison is making you think or is making you change, well, that means society outside of prison hasn't got the sources or resources or support that you should have needed before you went to prison. Yeah. So that's the way people are thinking now. Yeah. People are thinking, I'll and I when we when the the uh, there was a new introduction of a drugs policy recently, one of the working group, I think maybe one of the I, I could be corrected if I'm wrong here, the chairperson maybe would have said who was a judge, um that's retired. It's 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 better for some people to go to prison because they'll get the 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 supports and the the recovery uh, programs that they wouldn't have outside of prison. Now that's that's the way people from different stakeholders are thinking. Like the prisoners themselves are being brainwashed to thinking that if you can't get the support out here, then go to prison. Yeah, fuck. Isn't that crazy? That's like, crazy. So, so. Yeah, like, if you're somebody that takes drugs because you're struggling with your mental health, go to prison to get help. Yeah. 
So now we've, I, I don't know, roughly the last time I looked at the figure, it was like between 86 and 96,000 a year to keep a prisoner in Mount Joy. Yeah. So if that bloke, that young fella that had that conversation with you, we save him, say he's in there for 18 months or two years, and we invest that in whatever area, that 200 grand roughly, like, why is there a need? Why? Yeah. Why is there? And then there's the other point of view that people will be listening to this going, that was their choice. Yeah. They chose to go that route. We all know that drugs are bad. It's like, come here to me, just check that ground that you're standing on. Yeah. It's very fair when you yeah. make them types of statements yeah. because life is a funny old thing. Well, it's, you know it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's beating the stick with the same story, isn't it? Like yeah. that, oh, you made that decision, you made that choice, but no everybody's different yeah you know so yeah. not one pair there's there's a lot of overlook overlapping trauma and issues mm. in and a lot of the same communities represented in prison mm. but they all have their unique stories and unique yeah. upbringings and unique trauma and, and that um that's something that you can't say you made the choice to do that because like the choice has been taken from them from a lot of external uh, people mm. from 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 their outside. So, if you look at people that are in prisons, there a lot of the crimes are based off uh, how they want society to perceive them. Yes, you know, power, money, materialistic things, prestige, uh, violence, uh, and a lot of that would come from how they've been treated, how mm. their environment. And there's some that haven't had any issues, and they've committed crimes and they're just bad mistakes. Mm. You know, and anybody. It's crimes that are really bad mistakes. Mm. Uh, but there's a lot of crimes that could be prevented. Prison should be the last resort. Mm. So I, I'm a big believer in restorative justice. Mm. This country hasn't really looked at it too much just yet. Mm. You know, but it should be the last resort because our prisons are getting fuller and fuller, and yeah. our, certainly our policies aren't helping. No, and I, 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 I think personally as well. Like if we we really need to have a conversation in this country that if we're putting people, incarcerating people for drug offences or being, they owe drug debts and they have to carry something or whatever, do you know what I mean, that we're convicting these, there's a couple of other levels that we could run them through before they do this. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, we need prisons. There's certain people out there that have to go to prison, mm. but we could filter so many of them out with yeah. programs and and do you know what these people might reoffend and they might reoffend and they might reoffend you need to start giving people multiple chances yeah. do you know what I mean yeah. especially yeah. drug offenders depending but, on the, the the crime I agree yeah yeah like, yeah, yeah and I I don't think we're too serious in this country because the old opinions of that well you knew what you were taking or I'm from this area and we don't have that type of trouble mm. like we still are old catholic Ireland where we haven't really faced up to alcoholism mm. in this country or drink problems or drug problems it's always someone else or mm. no one's an alcoholic in this country everyone's heavy drinkers so we're still in <laughs> denial a bit about that do you know what I mean yeah and uh, again it's that normalisation like there's mm. people that drink Friday Saturday Sunday and, and they drink the units that would state that they're alcoholics functional alcoholics yeah. and a lot of people in this country I would yeah. say a huge percentage of this country that are oblivious that they're functional alcoholics um, and you know alcohol is the biggest killer in the, in, in the world it's the biggest yeah, it's the, the in terms of drugs it's the worst drug yeah. uh, because of the the issues around not just uh, being very dangerous for you as an individual but the, of how it affects people yeah. in the settings that you're in in pubs and Mm. Brows and victims from that and stuff like that. So there's, there's and yeah, it gets passed on through generationally as well. Like you know, there's a lot of research that would show that when you know you you see somebody that uh, like a parent that was struggling with alcoholism, that would have a lot of trauma on on the in the child going forward in life. I remember Miss Abney Vaughan lived in Australia for a while, and she, when she was walking down there, she walked in the bar industry. She walked as a barmaid or. or so she was serving people alcohol mm. behind the bar, sorry. Um, and she had to go on a course, and it was the responsible sale of alcohol course. Mm. So I'd never seen it in this country, no. but I remember she told me about it, and it was about, like, 
boy, you come in and you're locked and you want another drink. She mm. says no, mm. no. And boy, her saying no to you. They had all these statistics. She'd be able to, I can't remember what they were, but you were going to go home, punch the head off your wife, yeah. wrap the car, slap the kid around, do something stupid on the way out yeah. there. How much it reduced all that type oh, of yeah. stuff. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. On the way, that's the secondary. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, I remember listening to her the other going, fucking hell. Yeah. But that, I've no. never heard anything like that in this no, country. We're, we're, you know? we're, we're kind of naive mm. in terms of alcohol and just like I remember being on a late late show and I think um, it was actually I think it was John Connors I remember that spoke I about like you know yeah. that we're proud to be you know we, oh no it was actually Stephanie Prison. yes for, is it was Prison? John Connor who and you I remember yeah. Stephanie actually said look it's a shame that we actually are happy to you know I think maybe she said to me I don't know if she said online or, or, or live but she said to me like you know it's a shame that people are actually find that fun. Yeah, yeah. You know, that we're Irish and we love a drink and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, you know, and not realise the devastation it's had because it's because it's legalised, like, you know. Yeah. And it's it's you can buy it over the counter. Like but it's it, it's 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 crazy that you can I probably said this to you before, that you can go you, you know, under ID and you, you wait outside the offer, you get someone to win for you. Yeah. And you get a few drinks and but you can walk around the corner and get a bag of heroin. Yeah. And not know what's in it, not mm. know what's regulated. So we've got loads of different issues with the drug policies in this country. Well. Yeah, and 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 I I see it. I I find the teenage years of my young fellas the hardest. Mm. I'm finding this stage very tough because you're worrying a lot of stuff. Now we have this gas and balloons yeah. and all this type of stuff, and it's where I live. You know. People like to say, oh, there's none of that goes on out here. And it's or, or where I'm from originally, which my parents would have moved me out of an area to when I was younger. Mm. They didn't do it for me, but for my family. And it's fucking, it would be termed a middle class area. It's rampant. Yeah. It's fucking, there's no like, years ago, you spoke about it in your book, people went to a place to get stuff. Mm. Now, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. There's no... You don't yeah. have to go anywhere to get drugs. They're everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. The, 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 the most important thing that I learned about drugs, the most important thing, is that when a drug is kill, it will do really well. Mm. When it's unkill, it will die. Mm. And we have an example of that in this country. We have more people giving up cigarettes than actually smoking. Mm. Smoking is not kill anymore. No. All the ads you had years ago, star, stars and celebrities, brilliant to take it out of pubs. Uh, I think it was, was it Michael Martin that brought you to do that? Yes. So, you know, that was a huge step for this country. Even when you go abroad, some countries still smoking outside, and you're like, what, what's going on there? Like, yeah. Yeah. But look, the, the, the thing is, cool is the key word for it. Like, mm. vaping, coolest thing now since sliced bread. Like, it's so cool now to vape, like, and I just don't get it. I'm just like, what are you doing? Like? I look at people vaping and it's like, what are you putting a dildo in your mouth for? <laughs> this big steel yo. <laughs> it's like, that's what it looks like. I think it's some of them look like, you know the, the things that they do, the, 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 they call the ducks. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> fuck. Some of them are real big, some of yeah. them are small. I was walking in a building site, right, and you weren't allowed to do it. It was yeah. one of them data centres. I don't know what they were doing. I was like, this is just crazy. Blokes were drilling. 20 and 35 mil holes in their levels and putting the bleeding ah, vape in their levels Christ. because you weren't allowed vape it's just like what? I heard a good one the other day about actually cigarettes that we don't actually people that are addicted to uh, smoking um, basically what happens you'll hear the story a lot where you, you where someone stops smoking and then they go back on the smokes and you say why did you go back on the smokes like yeah. and they go uh I was stressed yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's 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 something behind that that I never realised right so you do obviously get it kind of addicted to nicotine mm. but they say you don't crave cigarettes mm. right and this is why so when you give up smokes what happens is you get a bit stressed and then your brain goes I need to get I need to smoke because mm. I'm stressed mm. but it's not the nicotine so much that relaxes you it's your breathing yes so you're meditating, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you smoke, you actually meditate because you're. Yeah, yeah. So that's what stops you from being stressed. Yeah. So actually, when you give up smokes, you need to take up something that de-stresses you. Yeah. Because if you don't, you'd think it's smoking that actually keeps you relaxed. Yeah. But it's your breath. Yeah. No, it's uh, my ma used to smoke when, like, she gave up just before me, but she used mm. to smoke like sixty a day. But that was back in the old days when like everybody did it. Everybody smoked. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and and. Uh, but it's I it, it is you see so many young people now doing it with the vapes and mm. it's cool. Mm. Vaping is cool. Smoking cigarettes is not cool. No. You know what I mean? Like nobody goes to try buy methadone, do they? No. Because it's like you know, yeah. If you didn't have pubs, yeah. I would argue that you probably wouldn't have like you wouldn't have people going to get drink. Yeah. Yeah. Because because yeah. pubs have made it we, like and it's been like generic right, since mm. a lot of our existence. People would have. Mm. you know down the country drinking houses that was their, their shacks and stuff yeah. like that and then I went to pubs but that that's drinking is cool why because you go to a pub you socialise you music you have yeah. nightclubs it's cool and I know plenty of people I know plenty of people that and me wife includes she have a bottle of wine there and our Spanish mate can't get her our Spanish mate can't get her head around this so Yvonne will have a bottle of wine right she'll open a bottle of wine on a Thursday maybe she might have one glass, right? Mm. Put the cork back in it. She might go back to it on the Sunday. <laughs> might, you know what I mean? And have another glass. And her Spanish mate is the same. She goes, why you Irish people? You, you open the wine and you have to drink the whole bottle. You can't just like yeah. drink a glass and put the cork back in it. Yeah, it's, yeah. I don't yeah. know. It, it's an Irish thing like do you know what I mean yeah. we don't do that and people that don't thing. drink yeah. like like I don't drink I'll go in I'll get a coffee or people I wouldn't trust someone that doesn't drink yeah. that's an Irish thing or, <laughs> I get that or, or the other one hungry cunt doesn't <laughs> yeah. drink I do get that a lot hungry you're cunt hungry because drink. you don't drink <laughs> and I'm just like I go into a place uh, or nowadays and I, I don't do you know like why you're hungry drinks. because you because you'd never buy people a drink maybe you know well I do I yeah, buy yeah. people a drink obviously yeah. but you know like yeah. You're, you're, if you're in company with someone that drinks and you don't drink, that person has to buy all his drink. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, that way, or so. I, I go into a place and some if, if they're decent tunes on, it's all right. But if I go into a pub, you know one of them pubs on like the place smells of fart, <laughs> smells of damn. Get well. me fucking hour here. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? At least the smoke kinda hid them years ago. <laughs> like I used to go to pubs years ago and be come home bleeding, dying sick. I was only in there for about an hour, it's all the smoking. Yeah. I used to be fucking dying sick. <laughs> you know, but uh, I suppose that's that's the way we are, you know. We mm. we we have a, a drinking culture, but I I I had a pal of mine. Now he's after going through recovery, rehab, the whole lot. He's in a program. I'm not going to mention his name, yeah, yeah. but he was floating around the Ballymun area for a while. He was from where I grew up. I remember talking to him. He was like, he was on the labour at the time. He'd just fallen through the cracks of society, mm. and he was on the labour. He wasn't working. He was a uh, crack user and I remember him saying to me when he was trying to in between him deciding to, to go clean and getting into like he had multiple ple people myself included ringing treatment centres for him every day and then they wouldn't answer till Tuesday right mm. and his biggest worry was collecting his labour because he had to walk by crack dealers mm. to collect his labour and that like even though he didn't want it, it was that like him explaining to me that will I won't I will mm. I won't I will I won't I and, yeah. and that's whereas if we had that 90 grand that was spent on keeping that fella in prison in the areas on open meetings or counsellors or free counsellors or f place for people to go just to give them a bit of space in between them and the crack dealer yeah you know well the key thing is like it's uh, like the most important thing is th th that the reason we haven't changed and the reason why we haven't went the same route as a lot of countries right one of the most prohibitionist countries probably where it came from where, where air policies came from the states have changed to mm. legalise in certain drugs mm. but the reason why we haven't because there's so much money involved mm. so 
it works what we have right now works for the minority mm. the people that are you know the guards um, judges solicitors um, prison guards to an extent all of these all of these doctors uh, doctors mm. uh, chemists yeah. why is there seven or eight chemists in Ballymun yeah yeah because that's what sells in Ballymun benzos you know? and all yeah. the tablets that come along with it yeah and if you if you if you have to if you have so many uh, demand in, in Ballymun of chemists well then we are as Ballymun people we're very sick mm. but medicine and all of those things aren't going to help us it's mm. the other lifestyle health things that will structures breaking poverty cycles ge generation cycles um, that's what's going to make a difference culturally mm. like you know but the, the reason why uh, we we have all of this happening is because it makes money mm. it, we don't want to change because the people that are you know making money in this don't want it and, and the people that are the minority don't have the voice mm. they honestly don't have the voice They're, they don't they can't if someone that was struggling with addiction stood in front of a group of people in Connor Street and tried to get it or even in front of the the, the doll and protest outside nobody nobody joined them mm. unless there were other people that are, were, were very similar uh, going through a very similar life to them like you know yeah. but it's I think I I hope I hope John there's there's some sort of a movement happening. Mm. There's enough there's enough trees being rattled currently. Mm. I think there's there's a couple of representatives that I know in in the hierarchy of society in terms of political world that could shake the trees a little bit more. But there's good people there also, and I think um, at some point I don't know when, but at some point I would say instead of everybody in this area that's pro change for people that are struggling with addiction fighting for buttons for funding and, and blah 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 I, I hope they all come together at one point mm. because that's what needs to happen mm. for change legislative legislative change you need you need to become the majority so same sex marriage um, the abortion um, referendum we had that has to be that's what has to, that's the strategy that has to happen that has to the, the country if you know somebody and there's a movement happen, you need to go you need to you need to protest whatever it may be mm. and I think that's the only thing that's going to make a difference because why because unless it's in your door yeah. it's, it's on your doorstep sorry it's this in your home you don't you are not dissatisfied enough to make a difference yeah 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 and and, and even that then with with drug addiction or alcoholism and, and just in my family it, 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 he wasn't a, a blood relative but he was a relative and I'd imagine you you feel you're a bit different now but you felt the same as well when addiction is in your family it's kind of like a dirty secret mm. you know and any family or any person that's listening to this they know an addict, they know an alcoholic, there's someone in their family that they're worried about, have been worried about, got clean, died, whatever. Everyone knows someone. But it's like we have this like Irish Instagram brain of Jesus, I want people to think well of me or a good person and there's no one affected, no one in my family like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And until we blow that stigma out of the water, people struggle. People struggle. People get addicted to things. You know what I mean? Mm. They suffer loss. They suffer pain, and they choose a painkiller. Do mm. you know what I mean? And mm. until we kind of are open to that, I don't think things are going to change. You know what I mean? Enough, yeah. If yeah. we 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 spend the twenty five, thirty grand, get your man offside mm. into a fucking addiction center or whatever, and tell, say nothing to no one, and hopefully he gets clean. I I think. We're another few years away from it, maybe. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. it doesn't seem to be. It's a business. It's a business for certain people in this country. It is, yeah, yeah, it is. There's a lot of money circulating, um, and it's just unfortunate which side you end up on. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so a drug dealer might think this is my opportunity. A solicitor might think this is my opportunity. I'd go as far as journalists, even. Yeah. You know, journalists making money on on on. Fields and crimes, and they're part of that. 
But I, I listened to a bloke there a while ago and I kind of got thinking about it. He was talking about the fellas in the Canada Goose Jackets, right? Arriving into an area and there's the Canada Goose Jackets and they're all selling for a big bloke mm. who lives out of the area mm. and he's making all the money in the area. And it's easy to focus in on them blokes because we can see them. We know what they're doing. And it's like society tells you to quench in the Canada Goose Jackets or whatever. But a yeah, man that lives outside the area the chemist, mm. the solicitor, mm. the copper. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They're yeah. all, they're all mm. okay. Some of them are trying to help and stuff like that, but they're all making money off the back of the same thing. Yeah, like. But I, I'm not saying they're in the same level, but they are. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, like, and it's a business. You, you, you would nearly perceive that there's not much money in Ballymun. Mm. You know, as an area, um, because of it's. It's one of the highest poverty rates in the country. Mm. However, when you think of that, it's probably, it's got a lot of money in the area. Mm. You yeah. know, that's circulating for, for, like, I mean, a few kicks off and the guards get 60 million over time a year. Mm. So that area brings 60 million a year. Yeah, yeah. Whatever way you want to put it, like, you yeah. know. So uh, there's money circulating because of crime, because of drugs. Uh, but you're right it, it, where does that money go like for example only recently they've created a grant for uh, any not any but some some of the money that's being confiscated and, and uh, the things that are being confiscated from CAB hmm. and that goes back into the communities for s programs or whatever but isn't that so wrong like mm -hmm. that it's got to that point you yeah. know and I think it's I think it's a good idea like but yeah. I think it's wrong that it's got to that point and my worrying thing is that some of those organisations that are maybe getting those supports that hopefully that funding stops one day but like then what do you do like so you stop funding a youth club and basically then they go back to square one yeah. because they can't open their hours like I remember looking outside when I was living in Ballyman looking outside my window one day and across the road there was a couple of kids taking cocaine I could see them sniffing it was outside the youth centre mm -hmm. on a Sunday night yeah yeah when they needed it like yeah yeah you know like yeah. Uh, yeah. Monday to Friday some of them were probably in school or whatever but like Sunday night like yeah on a Sunday night there was they must have been only about between 13 and 16 yeah mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. crazy mm -hmm. no but then I suppose on the positive now just be, you know the last time your kids are on the street I know plenty of, plenty of kids that were in sport and in clubs and, and they still got involved in addiction, mm. so necessarily, but if you're a betting man, <laughs> try and keep your kids in sport, try and keep them, make the effort, try yeah. and keep them off the streets, beyond them, you know what I mean, texting them and ringing them, and yeah. because it's, um, it's, we'd like to think maybe that was different in our day I think it's worse now I think it's it's only getting worse you know what I yeah. mean the kids getting involved in that type of stuff are younger and younger and younger you know the, the kids are, are struggling more and more to self-regulate their emotions you know mm -hmm. so um, they will connect more with something that they feel comforts them and, and does that for them like you know so mm -hmm. uh, I, do, I, I, I suppose there's somebody that actually uh, you quote a good bit is Gabo Gabo Mate, Mate yeah, you yeah. know and he says about there's something you want to do in terms of making a difference in addiction is you know make sure that the child is connected to the mother as much as possible mm -hmm. and that's something I've took on massively my job as a father is to connect uh, or support Sarah as much as possible and I'm not really doing it as best as I could I'm, I'm like I know I need to do more mm -hmm. and you probably always need to do more Yeah. but that job I think that's crucial if you think about a lot of the young parents, single parents in impoverished communities yes. is massive. Yeah. You know, and the resources they would have, some of them would have really good, some of them would have really good, you know, there's no point sitting here and saying there's people that are not availing of the, the public uh, services that are there, like, you know, yeah. social welfare services. But there's certainly, I think that should be the starting point. Mm. The next stage of that is, is making sure that you are the parent or, a, or, a, or the, the child has somebody that they can condone in and speak to you know that's yeah. crucial yeah if you're a parent that says 
don't take drugs, it's wrong. And when you take drugs, as soon as you say don't take drugs, you the kids like and I'm not saying tell the kid to take drugs, yeah, yeah. but as soon as you say don't take drugs, they won't come to you. Yes, because you're telling them I yeah. will be pissed off if you take drugs yeah. and you let me down. Yeah, it's, the, it's against the law. And, and instead of saying don't take drugs, say show them. Look, this is the pain and suffering that people that end up at the end of the addiction cycle go through. Yeah. And that's more powerful because that's what I see. Yeah. My parents said don't take drugs to me and John, but John did take drugs. Mm. But I seen the pain John went through and I didn't take drugs. Mm. So, and then if they fall through that gap, as I said again, there's certain things as a parent that you can't control. Mm. You know, because no. they're only at home as, as yeah. you know, as a, a small bit of time and whether in sports clubs or wherever else, there's a lot of external things that can happen. And again, it's all about support after that. And, and like, I have teenagers, I've a bit of experience and I've been around a bit. Like, taking that attitude as years ago, like my ma used to say, drugs, I'll kill you, <laughs> and everyone. Now they won't. Mm. <laughs> Not immediately. Mm. And, and like, your kids are going to experiment and yeah. you're an arsehole and their peer group know everything. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And they're going to experiment, but that you're there with an open mind and a calm head to pick up the pieces when they come in stoned yeah. and when they come in drunk or that you can have a conversation that isn't coming from that place of shaming them and ridiculing mm. them, that you're open and honest and... You need to take whatever and you know steps what, John, needs that, to come. You know what? That's difficult. Yes. For yeah. a parent. Like, cause yeah. it's, um, it's what you've been taught. Yeah, it's yeah. It's been passed down for years. Mm -hmm. That when some when a kid breaks the, the rules of the house, that you must punish them. Yeah. And you must speak them a certain way. And and it, it nearly needs to be trained to parents. Like, you know, mm -hmm. if your kid is is drinking or, or doing drugs and, and they shouldn't, obviously, mm -hmm. and they come home, this is this is some of the, the, the questions you should ask yeah. and uh, and then you'll discover a little bit more about your, your, your son or daughter like you know and I just think like one of the, the key things I say when I talk to people about addiction is like specifically parents is that if you say don't take drugs to kill you and the kid has already took drugs yeah. they think you're a spoofer yeah. you know because yeah. like, what well, you want to live you don't mm -hmm. you're outdated I've took drugs in the ground yeah yeah and there is kids that have took drugs once and died. Yeah, yeah. But they won't. That like, it's just a, it's just a lottery, really, isn't it? Like yeah. you know. So, yeah. that's the dangers of you having society. And there's more coming. Yes. There's more coming. So we have the balloons now, which is massive. Yeah. The vapes, what people are putting in the vapes, not just the, the actual vapor, yeah. like you know. So and there's a lot of other things happening, but uh, ultimately, ultimately, there's a lot of underlying things that we need to get better societally. And we started the conversation, kind of started the conversation uh, in terms of the, the drug stuff. It was it was about pointing the finger. Mm. If we don't get those things right, nothing else matters. Mm. Yeah, no, it's a, there's a, a bit of work to do, but I suppose how or the best quote I heard, I don't know who said this, is is like how do you change the world? Go home and love your family. Mm. That's all you can do. Like that, yeah, That's yeah. all you can do. Yeah. How do you change the world? Go home and love your family and come here. We yeah. go in stressed and we go in and we don't do our best days work every mm. day. But just try and be open. Try and be the person that if things go tits up that your kids are gonna come to you and you don't shame them and ridicule. Yeah. And as you said there, you know, you're going to be emotional, you're going to be hurt, but it's to put your own shit to the back burner and listen mm. to them. You know yeah. what I mean? That's yeah. That's go the, down to their level. That's what I try. Don't get mm. it right all the time, yeah. but that's all we can do. You exactly. know? That's all exactly. we can do. Yeah. Philly, I enjoyed that conversation. As always, John. I enjoyed that conversation, and uh, we'll do it again. Definitely. Maybe episode two hundred. Episode two hundred. Let's go for. It. Give uh, Philly a follow on Instagram. Um, B Deal Fitness here in Finglas Gym. It's Savage, Savage Facility. Get down to them. You're doing yoga, you're doing spin, you're doing... Yeah, with loads of different concepts, yeah. yeah. So, get on it. Press that button there, Phil.